Okay, and we're underway. And I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Lee Gudgeon and Joe Lindsay from Reed. Um, how are you both doing? Good, thanks, Johnny. Yeah, good, thanks, Johnny. Thanks for having us here. My pleasure. Thank you very much for joining me. So um, just to get us started, before we get into some of the topics we want to discuss around responding to the changing landscape and finding the optimal workforce mix, um, would you both be able to just give a little bit of background on what you do now, what you've done before, how you got into this uh, this crazy game we're all in? Um, so, Joe, can I start with you, if you could just give us a bit of a, a history yeah, so I'm, I've, I've worked in recruitment, actually, it'll be 25 years this year since I've been working in recruitment. Um, and I've worked within the sphere of uh, contingent worker programmes since uh, around about 2000. Um, that's seen me take on roles that have been everything from implementation through account management, client engagement, um, more recently within actually sales and helping our clients on board to the solutions within Read. Um, but also I have a, a large part to play in a part of our business called Consultancy Plus, which specifically looks at statement of work and services procurement programmes. Excellent yeah. stuff. Cool. Lee, over to you. I can't quite match Joe's 25 years, but I think it's around 23. Um, I started actually in um, the recruitment sector, as we called it then, down in New Zealand, and then did some time in Australia before heading back to the UK in uh, late late 2000s. Um, and um, have been at Reed for 12, 13, nearly 13 years. Um, and the last 20 years, particularly been in the the solution side be they permanent or contingent um, and now at Reed my role is consulting and workforce solutions manager director and I think that's a reflection of how actually solutions have changed we're not we're not don't talk about managed services we don't talk about temp or permanent because of the the very nature of what is a contingent resource and how we engage them so uh, yeah a wonderful 25 years 23 years in in the uh, in the industry and I look forward to catching Joe up. I think it's a really good place to, to start there is, Lee, is what you said about solutions. So the, the term solutions. Um, I've been involved in kind of workforce and recruitment um, and procurement technology for my whole career. And a lot of that time, certainly back in the day when I started out in the kind of job board area um, with ATS systems and, and um, job aggregators and things like that, recruitment recruitment clients were a very large part of what I was working on uh, and one of the things that's always struck me about the staffing industry is the resilience the adaptability of um, of those type of organizations um, and ultimately when it comes down to the core of it people businesses the staffing industry is people businesses but they're very good problem solvers um, because if you just take it back to the very kind of like traditional recruitment it's really difficult. It's really problematic. You're trying to deal with a product that is an a person that has their own will in the world. You're trying to put people together. You're trying to intermediate. There's so many factors to consider. It's not just about skills. It's about culture match. All these sorts of things to consider that smart recruiters can do really, really well. It's a problem solving exercise. And I think with what you're talking about in terms of how those um, how the services provided by staffing um, organizations have changed, that feels to me like it's always at the core of it um so so yeah i mean it's solutions really isn't it they it, it, it is solutions uh, I, I can remember appointing a, a a business development manager coming from a manufacturing industry he was delighted to be to be joining the uh, the people business side of things you know i haven't got to worry about um you know the product not turning up on time and things like that but uh, you'll you'll know johnny when when you're dealing with people as you said uh, they've got their own ideas that, that you you do need to manage people in, in a certain way so the solutions part um it is solutions and we we've we've embraced technology as a business and as a sector actually all, all of our competitors have also embraced technology um to help with provide solutions but as much as you automate, as much as you can use AI and you digitize all your services, you're more doing that from an administration point of view and trying to take away transactional activities because the value of the service still really fits with what the people do. Is that if that's if that's a triage service to determine actually what is the best route to 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 engage a, a contingent resource and in what shape you 
It's hard to do that through AI or tech. You need an experienced operator to understand what is the best way and the most effective way to engage a, a particular package of work or, or, or resource or consultant or freelancer or, you know, to temp. It, it, it's, um, it's a solution that's needed for for a person who needs a problem solving typically because they're, they're looking for uh, um, either a skill set or uh, additional labor or or a piece of work completed so and then they're never one size fits all so you're right to say solution and I think probably the biggest change we've seen in the last two to five years is the staffing sector in in the solution side so not your, your agency recruitment but the solution side it's drifting towards being a professional service more than it is a, uh, a recruitment provider or a staffing sector because of the, the the nature of the engagements and the nature of the way we, we're organising ourselves. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Joe, from your side of things, looking at it from a, a consulting angle, um, that's, a, that's a different slant on, slant on it as well, but very much in that professional services arena. It is. And, and I mean, it, it very much boils back down to what Lee's talked around in terms of, you know, every customer is different in that space. You know, the types of um, engagements or the types of challenges that they're presenting to you as a consulting organisation that they're looking for you to basically respond to, to, to help them develop a solution for are very different. I mean, we work across multiple sectors, you know, be that, um, you know, as broad as central government, local authority, you know, various areas within the private sector, um, you know, very specific niche areas such as the NHS. You know, there are there are different challenges that present themselves for the types of engagements that they're looking to work with us on in all of those areas. And some of them are very much driven around, um, you know, the outcomes they're looking to achieve. Some of them are very much driven around how they actually access the skills within um, the environment which in which they're operating in because you know as, as we're all very much aware of at the moment those skills are becoming increasingly difficult to to attract retain and uh, mobilize within our within our organizations and I guess really you know what we've had to to look back and and again you certainly what I've seen evolve in in the staffing sector over the last 20 years is you know when I first started talking to customers whether it was in contingent worker programs or, or indeed more recently in consultancy programs you know you, you there was an element of the solution that was perhaps vanilla that you were then choosing to add parts to and to an extent that that has changed significantly that now it's very much looking at yes the kind of tools that you have in your toolkit but actually each solution is is truly bespoke for a customer depending on what their requirements are and also you know in terms of workforce optimization where they are in the maturity of their own solution and they're, they're thinking in that part because again whatever they put in place for their organization um, you know it has to be the right fit at the right time for where they are in that development, not just almost kind of, you know, jumping on the bandwagon with whatever the, the latest kind of trend is within, you know, the contingent worker space. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting when you mentioned skills um, and obviously things like, um, you know, there are current skill shortages. There are various reasons for that. We can come on to that in a bit more detail, but um, skills, capabilities, it doesn't really matter where it's whether it's a consulting firm or an individual. The the client still needs to get some work done, um, and and I think that's something that the industry it feels like it's ch it's changed to focus from a kind of like a, a worker focus to more of a work focus. I, I would absolutely agree with that. I think I think there was um there was a there was a, a a danger point, and I think you know started to see some clients dial back for it where. Um, you know, clients got very nervous, for example, when the IR35 changes came in and some, you know, took a very broad brush approach that said they wouldn't have certain types of engagement within their within their organisations because, you know, it was very much about compliance and, and risk management, for example, whereas actually, you know, the, 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 the environment we're operating in today in terms of access to those skills, as you quite rightly say, be they from a consultancy firm, be they from a, you know, an individual worker, a freelancer, you know, tapping into the gig economy in terms of you know certain areas that are particularly predisposed to it such as I don't know, marketing for example you know they really have to be much more fluid and much more flexible um, in terms of how they how they choose to access those those skills and I said I'm personally quite pleased not only because um, you know I work in the sector and it, it makes our job easier if you're giving us multiple routes to market to to find find that talent but I think in terms of the 
the richness and diversity that having those different routes to market actually offer to organisations, you know, the types of people that they'll be able to be able to reach out to uh, will significantly enhance their, their business. They really shouldn't be limiting themselves to basically saying, you know, I want to fulfil all of my requirements in one area only by freelance or only by, you know, um, umbrella workers or only by PA wire workers. That, that in itself, I think, has quite significant impact actually in the makeup of their you know their their employer base and and the kinds of organizations actually that they would choose to work with yeah i agree and i think it's interesting when you when you look at it from that angle if you take r35 um it, there's a danger to trying to predispose how you're going to get a piece of work done hmm. um i mean I, I know we've spoken about this before lee in terms of how organisations have adapted to R35 and the decision-making process they have to go through. Um, in that, that's very, a very much a case in point for, it's about the work, not the worker really, isn't it? Yeah, it's about getting a, 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 a piece of work completed, isn't it? And, and I, th- I think we, we, we would naturally lead into the fact that R35 was a big trigger point to statement of works, probably gathering pace. You know, we've been, developing and delivering packages of work through this mechanism for, for 15 years as far as I know so it wasn't it wasn't new for us to do it but the appetite for the clients uh, evolved rapidly because the contract or the skills that we were talking about previously skills weren't available through the the traditional methods of, of engagement of, of work so that accountability to um, get the work completed, we were able to shift. If, if you could gauge them in, in, a, in a slightly different way, um, the, you know, contractors outside of scope, you can be out, outside of scope if you've got a right to substitution, etc. Not on supervision direction control. You, you know all of these, Johnny. Um, but we can access skills through through that route um, because, to, to Joe's point previously, if, if you for 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 the customer base to ensure you can make yourself tracks as possible and get the skills you need. You need to be able to um, engage in different ways. And a lot of clients are actually trying to determine uh, what's a contractor, what's a subcontractor, what's a, what's a professional service provider, what is a, what is a temp, <laughs> what is a contractor uh, inside a scope. So, so this determining route to get a piece of work done to access the right skills is, is almost this service that we provide now in, in this triage service up front. Yeah, it's really interesting. I di- I just... Um... We just released a podcast that I did with um, Georgina Jones from Co-op and a guy called Dougal McIntyre, um, who uh, worked for a consultancy. And um, basically, they did a really interesting piece of work around worker categorization uh, mm-hmm. within the yeah. Co-op. Um, they, they put, they, they, they've run it past these, you see, within the APSCO kind of uh, website. I think there's a link on the podcast. But if you can't define that in the first place, then you're in quite a difficult situation, really, aren't you? And it's, I always sort of think, you could look at you could look at statement of work and go, oh, that's the solution to all the problems. Or you could look at contracting and go, it's the solution to all the problems. It's they're just different ways of getting work done. And actually, IR35 was a good catalyst for making the industry realize, and, and to be honest, things like the growth of the gig economy, to make the the whole industry, the workforce industry, realize that actually it's about what's fit for purpose for that particular piece of work. And you need to be able to access all the different channels. I think, you know, read the way that read is structured, because you've got You've got kind of project delivery capabilities. Um, is that project solution, three project solutions? You've got the consultancy plus angle. You've got MSP, RPO, traditional recruitment, job. So you've got a lot of angles to the, what to what Reed do. I think for some organisations, it was a bit more of an adaptation for some staffing organisations because they didn't necessarily have the breadth. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And, and, let, and let's not forget our, our, our supply chain, our supply chain too. But yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. We we need to be able to, do, to help our customers determine cat, cat, the categories of staff. And then and then where the challenge comes in, Johnny, is, is, is just taking the hiring management that journey because we can get agreement with HR and procurement about the categories and, and how best to do that. But then you've got to make sure you've got the infrastructure and the skill sets to to educate the hiring managers at the point of engagement. I say hiring managers, they're not always hiring, hiring or buying. We now call them hiring or buying managers because they might be buying something. And I'm sure Joe's seen that both in solution design and, and, and execution. We have. I mean, that that whole hearts and minds activity in terms of, you know, what you get the hiring managers to actually commit to in terms of their engagements with you. I mean, it, it, it's interesting. You said right at the beginning of um, this this session, Johnny, you talked about, um, you know, it's about 
it, it's perhaps a much more personal purchase. You're, you're not buying pens or pencils when you're entering into arrangement to to procure, you know, a work a workforce solution. You're actually procuring the person that potentially you're going to be sitting next to and working alongside for, you know, the next six to nine months on a on a project. So that personalization of the, if you like, the purchasing process actually drives, I think, much stronger behaviors in in hiring managers as to how they choose to interact with, you know, whatever mandate comes from procurement or HR as to actually how they choose to engage with with the service itself. And I think part of the, um, certainly a big learn for me actually from the early days of, of managed services back in sort of like the early 2000s was, you know, I think to start with, there was very much a kind of um, a stick approach to kind of mandating those kinds of deals. You know, it was kind of like, you know, you will only use this supplier and, you know, everything else was almost deemed to be off contract spend, where actually it was it was a much more wise uh, approach to kind of put your arms actually around that supply chain and basically instead of saying they were non-compliant was actually to make them compliant to your process and then over a period of time evaluate what actual value they could continue to add as part of the solution or part of the the supply chain and in that way you didn't have to change the you know the almost the hearts and minds of the hiring community overnight And, and, and I personally think you know again that's very much the approach that lends itself to when you're thinking about Um, adopting you know SOW or services procurement programs in particular within you know your wider managed service program or choosing how you actually optimize your workforce bringing those those managers to the table with with those um, opportunities and and those types of engagement and indeed you know those historic incumbent supply relationships all available for them to access is a much better way of actually getting a long-term change position you know whether that comes from and and I know a lot of organizations and I suspect you know co-op may have been one of them had a you know they almost started from a place of wanting to tick the boxes around visibility and compliance and being seen to do to do the right thing in light of things like IR35 changes but very quickly I think it becomes apparent the additional value that having that supply chain all managed through one sort of mechanism in terms of you know a triage service or an overarching service actually offers the organization in terms of being agile and again it's interesting we've talked quite a lot about IR35 as maybe a catalyst for some of these changes you know I personally believe that you know that the the skill shortages that that we're seeing and indeed you know the fact that remote and hybrid working and you know continued globalization in terms of the workforce and how it interacts um, aren't two and things that are going to go away anytime soon I, I think they're probably going to be as large a catalyst for change in terms of how organizations access talent as actually something you know that was enforced upon the the, the sector in terms of um, you know compliance changes have actually turned out to be. And just, sorry to in, interrupt but to, to Joe's point that, that the early foundations of the managed service and we, we might call it solution now but that visibility control and compliance probably still are the fundamentals it's just it's got broader so it's not just about a poe temp and a limited contractor it's now across that con- entire categorization that we, we we sort of touched on earlier i think i think that stays still there because you can't forget about the the, the risk profile that the engaging a contingent workforce can bring depending on how you know just just tax alone just just just, just the tax status that we have to go through it has got broader, and I think it's really interesting to see how organisations are embracing this within MSP partners and, and giving them access to more scope. And in some cases, they're really um, organisations are struggling with that to kind of get over the hurdle of, for example, bringing services procurement into it. Um, and I also really agree with the point you made around other factors, Brexit, COVID, home working all these sorts of things and to a certain extent a lot of it is driven this outcome based mentality um to to come a bit to the fore um but joe in terms of ir35 so one of the things that we certainly noticed was the impact that obviously this had on the on the public sector Mm -hmm. um back when it came in 2017 or whatever it was that it came into the public sector and there was a clear transition and evolution within the public sector about how they definitely adapted more to using SOW as a as a as an option of that's how a different way they could get work done. Um, do, do you, have you noticed much in the way of uh, differences between the way that the public sector have adapted to it and the private sector are? Um, I sort of cast my mind back to uh, 
2017 and and at the time I was actually in a, a role which was a account management or account directorship role so you know part of my day-to-day -day activity at that time was taking some of our public sector clients through through that transition and through that through that journey and I think um, I think the public sector was faced with a slightly different dilemma to actually what the private sector was faced with in that you know they were still trying to access talent quite often in um, sectors or occupational areas where they were in direct competition with the private sector so a good one being tech and IT for example where actually it was no longer a level playing field no. because actually though those workers you know clearly could continue to work in outside IR35 um, engagements you know long past the point at which it was you know po possibly not an option via a traditional route in the in the in the public sector and again if you look at you look at some of the clients who perhaps are you know most disadvantaged in that space who have private sector um should we say comparisons you know so be they you know people for example who regulate financial markets who you know might be drawing on the same types of skills as actually the financial services sector in the wider area or you look at for example the dichotomy between uh, the private and public sector within media for example and, and you know traditional broadcast media for example and it, I think it very much created actually much more of a catalyst in the first instance within the public sector to be quite creative about how they carried on um, accessing that talent which perhaps wasn't something you know when you think about the kind of uh, should we say that you know the stereotypes that you hear about the private and public sector in terms of perhaps their appetite for for risk or innovation it perhaps didn't naturally fall where you you thought it would have done um, we had quite a large number of clients um, and some of our biggest clients when the private sector um, side of things hit who were financial services who for all the reasons that you would think of financial services took quite a risk averse approach to it so again you know being quite dictatorial about how they actually were were proposing to to engage with the market so I think we definitely saw a difference in terms of almost kind of a needs must attitude to risk in terms of adopting um, statement of work programs that said I think for private sector organizations I'm not sure that IR35 has been the driver for what we've actually seen as being the progression into in particularly SOW um, activities I think genuinely there has been it's not all been about um, you know uh, access to talent who want to engage in that way it's actually been much more focused around wanting certainty of outcomes and certainty of price and certainty of um, the level of risk that they have on particular contracts and I, I kind of think the kind of the access to talent thing is as, up until this point has possibly been a bit of a side gig for them in terms of why they've chose to adopt um, those types of principles and you know and we we deliver a lot of um SOW programs within the within the tech space and you know and obviously just the nature of the types of uh, projects and transformation programs that are ongoing um, you know in that area they lend themselves to you know meaty chunky projects or programs that you know fit very well within statement of work um, sort of parameters so as I said I think I think it's probably a different push and pull factors as to why the two sectors have kind of gone down that route at sort of you know probably equally equally pace if that makes sense or equal pace um but but probably with different different reasons in the outset yeah I, that's really interesting what you're saying as, as you've highlighted a very good point there in terms of the public sector being forced to be more agile and adopt innovation whereas within the private sector it was kind of like you say it was a level playing field effectively mm. and so they were there, there was the opportunity to just say i'm not going to spend the time and effort thinking about how to do things differently i'm just going to say no, we're not doing that because there's risk involved in it. And a lot of organisations in you know, financial services, pharmaceutical, highly regulated industries did take that type of approach, big companies. But I, I sort of, I wonder, I don't know whether this is anything that you guys are seeing, but I've always sort of thought to myself, there'll be like a multi-stage approach to it in the, in the private sector, because what will happen is people will take a mandated approach initially, some companies will do that, and that will satisfy the immediate regulatory requirement. But at some point, they are going to find that, that stuff is not getting done because if they haven't adapted and obviously the smart ones that have adapted, they, they're riding through that. But for, for companies that haven't adapted and have taken a really strong arm approach with just a, a very kind of um, blinkered view, um, surely they're going to run into problems at some point. Um, Johnny, I, I'm, I think the private sector comes in many forms. So 
um, to, to, to some of Joe's points earlier, some, some just took the blanket approach because of risk. Some companies could actually afford just to say, actually, they're all inside because they could afford it. So some of your big tech players, media players, investment banks could afford that change and did not want to lose that talent. So running into that problem, they kind of, I guess, if you like, circumnavigated that or, or do risk that up front by saying, inside our 35, they're all inside our 35, but let's add 30% to, to the pay. They actually compensated the contractors immediately. And, and I think right now, as you know, because the, the, as much as an impact on companies, the R35 is quite an impact on people slash companies that that were used to operate in a certain way and possibly took home 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 a certain amount of money that they, they were used to and, and uh, become adapted their lifestyle to that. So so they need they also had to go through an adaptation period. But the candidate market as it is now, or the skills market as it is now, or the even if you try and, try and get a tradesman, Johnny, or, or anybody actually, the skills or services, uh, BPO, et cetera, that's also busy. I think I think companies have just got to adapt. They, if they listen to us and, and we can sort of share the challenges to the resource market, whatever that, however that's engaged, they'll recognise that oh, we have to pay more if it really is inside. You, can't, you, you, know, you don't want to um, get on the wrong side of HMRC or they will look to, to an alternative route if we can get a, a project delivered on time at a certain price. But it's, it's that... That that candidate in the skill set market, I think, means they're having to to possibly pay more rather than adapt. Because I think the adaptation has happened. Yeah, and um, you know, part of this comes back to what you were talking about in terms of triage. So where you're working with customers, that's you know, it's a question of looking at the piece of work that needs to be done, considering compliance angles, considering the pragmatism of how long is this going to take, how much is this going to cost, do I have certainty of an outcome or not? Is that the best way to do it? Um, what type of supplier will be able to get to do it? Um, in your experience, Lee, with with the kind of how the MSP program so or the MSP scope has evolved, um, how much has triage changed in its nature and also in its level of importance? Um, significantly. If you give a really short answer, it's significant. Um, and Joe's team do a lot of the the, the scoping. Um, one one of the teams does a lot of the scoping and solution, and he's got another team that's delivering that part, that, that, that consultancy element. But the short answer, Johnny, is significance and, and probably that's where the value is being placed in the service, more so than the actual access to the talent, almost that's a given nowadays, however that comes. But if you can get the categorization and the, 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 the triage service, that is probably where the, the, the real value is and it's a significant change. It's just so complicated. <laughs> so I always look at that and go, <laughs> it's, it's a really complicated thing. And it's like from a technical point of view, um, addressing it is not actually that complicated. From a, from, a te- from a software point of view, to run a triage, to have decision trees and all this sort of thing, it's not that complicated a piece of technology. What's complicated is the kind of programming behind it or the, or the knowledge base that goes behind it. And, you know, potentially that's why in a lot of triage programs, it'll be like, you know, uh, a guided buying route, but there'll also be uh, a triage, very much a service around it, where is actually people interacting it. Because, yeah. Joe, I mean, I know you'll uh, you'll be very uh, kind of uh, kind of used to this, but services are, can be quite vague, really, can't they, in terms of defining what it is? They, they, they can, and and I mean, you know, some, sometimes it's kind of even when you read a specification. You, yourself when you're actually involved in you know engaging with that customer and procuring it it's kind of like you know you, quite often you can get to the end of like you know four or five pages of you know specified requirements and you're kind of still asking yourself what is it do they actually want to first of all buy here and achieve and I think sometimes that achieve or that focus on the the outcome thing is actually probably the most important thing to to analyze in part of that triage process so again if, if I bring it back to a real life example for us which you know isn't isn't one that um you know isn't one that perhaps gets talked about in the mainstream around um services procurement piece but you know where you've got a organization um who are working you know let's just say for example within central government and they have very specific 
outcomes that they're they're looking to achieve but they come with a specification which is very much centered around you know these are the people that we need to employ to make this service work it's only by you know the decision tree you could go to could very quickly say oh yes they've talked about people yes you know that's a that's a contingent worker worker program you know it's x you know tens or hundreds of people or whatever deployed in this fashion for this period of time um, through a traditional route to market through um, you know a temporary a temporary labor supply route effectively a contingent worker program but when you actually drill it back to sort of through that triage process being actually able to interact with them around what it is they're trying to achieve what those outcomes are that's when you're then able to open up a much wider breadth of discussion about actually whether you know you're looking to provide that work through an outsourced arrangement through a supplier actually whether it's a program that you can deliver through a you know a specified statement of work with milestone payments against you know outcomes as as you deliver that work for them and I think as Lee said you know that that value that that is where you know any intermediary and in our case an intermediary that's able to bring the experience of being a, a managed service provider can really start to add value to their to their customers I think one thing that I've probably observed in that space is um, there is there is um, you know if, if we if we are bidding for or working with a customer to design and, and implement a what I would call a traditional contingent worker program you know so covering um, PAYE, you know, umbrella and, and potentially PSC contracts if, if there are out of scope requirements in there. It's, it's you know, it's a very much a procurement led process. Um, it is, um, you know, increasingly over the years, it's become a much more commoditized um, product that they're effectively purchasing. You know, that the focus is, you know, yes, yes, they'll talk about quality. Yes, they'll talk about risk. But, you know, there has been an ongoing pressures and desire to you know to drive down the cost in that place some of that through efficiencies in the in the in the service but some of it you know just through natural competition within the you know what is quite a crowded marketplace when you start to talk to customers about a wider breadth of um workforce engagements there's a much wider conversation about actually workforce optimization with the hr community as well which hasn't actually always been the normal um sort of route the way the conversation's gone if you've been talking about contingent programs I mean I can think of contingent programs where actually HR have almost been kind of bystanders to, to what's happened in the process it's very much been around procurement and I think once you're able to open those conversations up because you're talking about different workforce um optimization strategies again you can add much more value to an organization as a provider because you're actually able to talk about it in a holistic way you're not necessarily talking about you know just how they source um you know temporary workers or effectively just allowing them to aggregate their spend and and benefit from you know kind of their their, their purchasing power so that is genuinely something that i think i'm seeing emerging as as clients are being or, or reaching a, a, a greater level of maturity in how they combine these different um, engagement routes together yeah and it does it throws up opportunities, but it definitely throws up problems as well. Um, Lee, again, looking at the kind of transition of, of how MSP programmes are evolving, how do you manage the the kind of changing stakeholder relationships that, that are coming out of some of these changes? So exactly as Joe was saying, you know, might typically have been a procurement buy for a contingent workforce programme, but actually in some organisations, I'm sure you've seen this as well, Joe. I've seen that actually be talent that are buying contingent workforce, but services procurement will be something completely separate that sits within procurement and isn't kind of, is, is very separate. But Lee, from your point of view, how do you manage those changing relationships? Because it's definitely shifted. Yeah, so changing relationships from a um, solution design perspective, and then there's the change of relationships in when you start to execute. So if I start the execute piece, um, if, if through the triage service you've determined that actually this is best done under under a package of work, be that statement of work or work package, if the buyer is used to being a hiring manager and they're going to supervise and sort of onboard and take, take control of the outputs of that worker, um, when you start to sell them a statement of work and whether or not you spec out the work or actually you just, you, you just design the package of work to deliver the outcomes that are already spared. That's quite a transition for that, that, that individual to think that the mindset is entirely different. And 
typically a statement of work is more expensive because there's some element of risk to it which you don't necessarily have in a in, in a contractor or a temp basis so they might look at that project and say well that's more expensive but you and i know johnny contractors <laughs> contractors have been <laughs> contracted for 10 years sometimes <laughs> in some clients so actually if you deliver a piece of work in six months and that's done <laughs> it's done there you go. Uh, and, and the value you might get from the IP transition, um, as opposed to a worker just con- continuing there for, for years and years and years. Um, so so there's, a, there's a big piece of work there to understand, to educate them on, on the value of, of uh, completing a task versus supervision control of, of, a, of a worker for you. So that, that, that is just, that's time. That's um, ensuring that your your service is people based, really, Johnny. And this come. I know, I know we'd like to automate as much as we can, but ultimately, you need to take the 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 customer on on that journey through education, um, and try and keep it as simple as possible. And then, and when that survey you talked about the spec in the last question, just reduce the spec where possible uh, and, and keep it simple. So we've got we've got some sort of fixed outcomes. So so I think it's the people as an education piece at, at the buyer. So that would come to execution. The up the upfront the upfront piece uh, comes comes back to I guess all solutions or services is just make sure that we we're working to solve the problem that the customer has, yeah. um, and if if you can if you can get to the heart of what the problem is and what you're trying to solve, typically the solution um, the solution will 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 be will be sort of developed. Um, what I do know is, and me and my team, including Joe here, have been talking. Uh, a lot about recently is we don't have a lift and shift solution anymore which we perhaps did five ten years ago in terms of msp right roll that one out roll that one out roll that one out i don't think we've got one of the same now (laughs) they they are designed much more bespoke because um to uh, really to really to answer that 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 very first point that, that you asked how how do we make sure that we can we can take people on that transition and because everybody's at different buying stages, different sizes, different needs, different categorizations of what a resource is. Um, everyone's different. Joe, I'm sure you've seen that through your solutions team. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, t- to be honest, it, it, it comes down to me, well, for two things. It's first of all, actually understanding what the client's drivers are and being, for want of a better word, high enough up the food chain in the customer to actually get to the people who are, you know, genuinely making decisions about, you know, their workforce strategy, because, um, you know, get getting engagement from those different communities, you know, be they HR and procurement, or indeed, you know, the hiring manager, or actually the CIO that's got, you know, a, a you know, multi-million pound, you know, IT tech transformation program to deliver. They all have various different needs that if you can, you can react to, you will get their, their buy-in. And a classic case in point for me is, you know, when we've gone to talk to organizations about contingent worker uh, programs for example and I remember a particular client acting with surprise where we started talking to them about what their internal mobility strategy was from a workforce um, you know optimization point of view or workforce planning point of view where to me that's an absolute integral part of you know what you would be engaging with an external provider who provides your contingent worker program about because you know those two things will will dovetail together you know the internal mobility to an extent is a substitute product for you know contingent worker programs so if you're operating at the the right level that you're able to have those conversations at the right level I think it becomes a much easier you, you know you can you can genuinely if, if it's even a word solutionize with your with your customers and actually demonstrate how you would add value in that space and I think again you know it's stating the obvious but um you know services procurement I've initially when I started getting involved with it I, I almost kind of felt to an extent embarrassed that you know we were going as a service provider of a particular type of, of, of services Reed was known for at the time which was staffing and talking about how they engaged with the wider um, if you like the wider ecosystem of, of kind of uh, worker engagements that, that were available of which one of them could actually be supply chain engagement through a services procurement piece because these people had you know lots of letters after their name that related to procurement I had some letters after my name that related to HR kind of thing Um, but but in terms of what you're actually doing as an organization when you're adding value around that services procurement piece you're actually bringing rigor to how those how those interventions 
dovetail with again that workforce optimization program you know we're not here teaching them how to you know how to order i don't know the parts in their automotive supply chain for example what we're saying to them is you have an outcome that needs to be delivered actually what's the best way of delivering this outcome and actually we have expertise across this this whole range and i think the the bit that you know is obviously still attractive to procurement is you know if you look at some of the savings that have been delivered out of again traditional um managed service programs contingent worker programs you know you've taken you know what was actually even 20 years ago relatively well managed pockets of spend because of how big they tended to be within organizations you know they had specific category management around that but by putting process in place where you've actually um you know whether it's a triage whether it's um you know procurement practices themselves as long as you're able to add value to that you're basically giving them an opportunity to potentially untie or, or to potentially tame what is largely untamed parts of their procurement spend you know the the bleed for example in from contractors into consultancy you know that gives them an option you know very much to to target that so it, it was less about then sort of feeling embarrassed that I was talking to them about procurement expertise it was actually saying I'm talking to you from an expertise about how you actually engage these skills or um, you know these types of workforce engagements within your your wider overall program so that that for me you know going back to the very first question you said is how, how do you go out and engage with these and perhaps stakeholders that have different um, you know buying paths in terms of how they choose to do it it's about being relevant to them at each point and you know showing that we're adding you know we're adding value as a service provider yeah and you're still solving the problem aren't you you're solving the problem of what's the most effective use of our resources I'll never forget a CEO said that to me. He's like, that's the one thing I want to know. What's the most effective use of all the resources I have to hand? Um, so for you guys in a central position, you're, um, you're, you're helping them marshal how they resource work that needs to be done. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting what, what you were saying, Lee, about how <clears throat> the, the traditional contingent workforce programs have been more commoditized. That's, mm -hmm. that's definitely true. And it's kind of you can drive those things down and you're making savings and then it's it becomes more difficult to make bigger savings the way that the supply chains are really buttoned up on the recruitment side and how efficient the process is. But if you look at something like services procurement, it's such a greenfield area in terms of the potential savings where, you know, nothing's in a competitive bid, nothing's measured, half of yeah. it's non-compliant, it's all spreadsheets. It's just it's an area where there's huge, huge opportunity to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think it might have been Joe that said that uh, the the uh, the contingent uh, workforce solutions had been had been commoditized. Um, so I don't want to say even, but, but I I absolutely agree with that. And and you you're right. The savings aren't necessarily available there. If, if anything, that 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 price point's going to go up because of all, all the cost pressures we're under in in, in the big wide world. Um, so where are savings available? And um, we're, we're making sure you get the best access to talent and um, control, visibility, compliance, et cetera, all, all of those things in, in, in an effective supply chain, ESG, EVP, EDIB, all of, the, all of the wraparound services. But if we are still talking about savings, absolutely, Jolly, that's the area to, to look at in terms of, of savings. And I, think, and I think that's because the, you, you, you're typically looking at um, uh, Higher, higher, be it day rates, or you've got the the, the more expensive uh, resources that that sort of provide. If, if to Joe's point earlier, it's a big tech transformation. You, you're looking at a be it skill set um, that, that is expensive, um, and traditional margins. If, if they're on the expensive resource, that's um, that that's greater. Um, that's that's a greater fee. So our, the, the savings are, are absolutely there. And I think that's probably because a lot of companies, and this comes down to basics, but a lot of companies monitor their headcount. And, and you know, you can put headcount on that, but there's caps on that. There isn't always a cap on consultancy spend. So consultancy spend had this kind of free roam to just to just spend. So quite often resource was being purchased as consultancy or resource was being badged up as consultancy and, and, and going in, in that route. So that is the next evolution for us to get control of that. If, if, if savings is the objective, you definitely can, can get savings there and we'll be able to. Greenfield is probably a bit, bit, bit more than green, I think, Johnny, but um, yeah, savings can absolutely be gained from, from that area and whilst 
we, we don't want to see the margin go further down on the traditional <laughs> tent labor do we joe that is that is not not what we're about right now <laughs> no no, but, uh, yeah, I think yeah, it's it, and it's about it's about value, isn't it? And, it, and you know, you, it's it's like anything. You know, if uh, if someone's in a in a very traditional recruitment transaction and they drive the fees down too much, then the best talent's not necessarily going to be available to them. It's you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. But um, I think um, yeah, savings on the services side, huge opportunity, but also is is a lot of opportunity for increasing compliance on that side, and that's one of the. Yeah. Feels like a bit of an after effect of R35 in the sense that how many organisations have effectively addressed the disguised um, contracting within their services procurement supply chain? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really big. I'll, I'll let Joe comment on, on it more. But absolutely, um, if, if, if services or if consulting is really actually a resource that's been bashed up as a resource um, and you've got regulated customers which many are uh, that all need a uh, certain you know individuals however they're being engaged to go through certain compliance angles then that is another key reason why people are looking to get control of of what's happening there and you'll have seen that a lot joe wouldn't you in terms of the vetting if you like that the service providers have to go through yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, you know, at the very basic level, again, I can remember um, you talk about disguised. I think it's um, kind of uh, comedy disguise is how I describe it in some some places. You know, it's kind of a pair of pair of glasses and a moustache is about as kind of disguised as it as it got. But, you know, working with customers actually in MSP implementations where, you know, you'd be going through a list from their accounts payable ledger and you know you would know that some of the things that they were saying were out of scope was absolutely by the companies that were providing them or uh, subsidiaries of the companies that were providing them was you know it was effectively disguised uh, temporary workers for except uh, you know for, for example and I think you know when you look at um, again the the opportunity not only for um, I guess savings as we, we've talked at length about but actually compliance or bringing some rigor actually to the process of how you onboard and and work with those organizations you know that that for me is where services procurement is going to add the most um you know the most value as it you know either as a standalone product or as i said sitting within a wider um msp type solution yeah. and, and johnny co companies almost have a view oh, i'll pay more for consultancy now do resource so instantly they the hire or the buyer is was almost happy to pay for that, even if the services is actually the same. And one of the reasons why the buyer or the hiring manager chooses to go to their consultancy is because if you don't have to go through vetting for the individual resources, you can get them on board a week later rather than four or, or six weeks later. So uh, there might be some asset management issues, but um, the, that that that's why trying to get hold of that to make sure compliance comes in. It does mean it might not be the greatest hiring manager or buying manager experience because you might have to wait a bit, but compliance is key. It's, it's absolutely fundamental. You've got to reduce your risk. Totally. And things like IR35 of, of uh, well, just generally companies have to be on top of this stuff. They can't afford to have compliance problems going on with all of the other stuff they've got to worry about, about how quickly the market's moving, all the different factors that are operating that are affecting them. Things like COVID come along, Brexit, R35, global events. It's they've got to be on top of the basics, haven't they? But I think what just to pick up on two of the things that that, that we were just discussing there. One was around people using it as a, a kind of uh, an escape route. Where uh, it's incredible. I totally agree. When you might have like a headcount freeze, or if it's a PLC, you know the, the headcount numbers are important um, for for you know public reporting and all that sort of thing. But consulting spend is like uncapped, yeah. and it, and it's and it's just that's where you get that rogue spend that the companies need to get under control. But the other thing I was going to just sort of go back to, um, Lee, you mentioned about the perception that getting something done under a, a procured piece of work with clear deliverables and an outcome um, is perceived to be more expensive. But actually, I think that's a, it's a really interesting area because I think that's a natural default perception. But yeah, if you've got if you if your business is organised enough to say this is what we need to do and this is when we need to do it by, that's going a long way towards being efficient in the first place. And then if you pay for that and it happens and it happens on time to cost, great, you're doing well. Whereas the other side of it might be it might seem cheaper because you're hiring headcount of some kind and it's just the headcount's there on the never never or certainly was in the back in the, in the past. You know who's who's keeping an eye on what was actually has anyone even said what was going to be done by when in the first place. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's really interesting because, you know, when I, I tried to explain to um, a group of our uh, graduate um, scheme trainees who joined recently about what, what we did in Consultancy Plus, and, you know, the, the most simple analogy I've used to explain it has been, you know, would you ever employ a, a builder to fix your roof on a, you know, on a day rate? You'd go, how many days is it going to cost? You'd let them go up on the roof, check it out, you know, decide what work was going to be involved. And then you'd agree a price and, you know, what the cost of materials were going to be, what the cost of labour was going to be. And you would agree a, you know, an outcome based on that. Whereas, you know, what you're effectively saying when you're adding headcount is just kind of like, well, I might, I might be paying you £200 a day instead of £400 a day, but you know go for your life take as many days as you as you like you you to an extent put in place controls because you will have things like purchase order numbers or lengths of assignment when you know those uh those original assignments or engagements are made but you know if the work's not done at the end of that what happens you know it takes a very brave person to then stop a project six or nine months through you're effectively just saying actually I'm resigned to the fact that I'm going to you know raise a new PO number for you know another three weeks or for another 10 heads or whatever it takes to get to get that outcome delivered so you know it, as you said it's kind of a it's a bit of a well it's not a bit of it. it's a complete fallacy that actually it's it's always going to work out more expensive in the long term and I think sometimes it's just about you know whilst an individual a, a hiring or a buyer might see you know that analogy as a roofer it's exactly how they'd operate in their um you know, their own personal space. It's about getting them to take the same level of responsibility or understand that the same options are available to them in terms of different types of workforce engagement or optimization. actually when they're thinking about how they're going to go to market and engage the skills that they need to get a particular job done. Yeah, and, and Johnny, it comes budget manager. Do you have a budget? If, if I've got a budget, here you go, I'll go and do that for that budget. So there's you, you, peace of mind to a point. The, some some of the finance team like it because you might only pay in three stages. So actually, the, the the payment terms and the profile looks better for the business as opposed to a contingent resource. I know I've got to pay the agency or staff in supply on, on a weekly or, or or four weekly basis. So the, the, you can go on and on with terms of the the, the contractual nature, um, from insurance to to risk, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, with it too. And I, I don't want to I don't want to um, say you should never engage a um, uh, a, a, a contractor uh, uh, under a supervision control method again because of course there are skills that they bring and you, you might not expect out of the project but one of the other value pieces that a statement of work or a work package can offer is the scoping of the project so if, if a customer isn't quite ready to say here is the spec you, you know we, we've got a lot of a lot of architects now that help help the customer um, spec out the project. Now, that, that is additional value in terms of, you know, buy when, buy how, who, how many people, what you're going to need. If you, if you can offer that additional value, um, that, that, that helps in terms of the budget control too. Yeah, and ultimately, in terms of however you, you need to get it done, it's always going to be horses for courses. It's, it's always going to be the right route, the right channel, for that piece of work and the circumstances and the setup of the organization and where they are on the maturity curve and what their internal capabilities are. Because, you know, in some cases, when you're, if you're triaging it and you're looking after everything from an overall workforce planning perspective, it might be, well, actually that's three hires or because that's definitely going to be fully in scope for the next five years within this part of the business. And which leads me on to my next question, which is who the hell owns it? And I think that's a, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer, I think, but I'd just be interested in your perspectives on this because um, this is this is something that the scope of what an MSP can help with and the solution can that the problem it can solve has got broader and, in my opinion, much more logical in the sense that it encompasses now at the at the best level. How do, what what's the piece of work? What are all your options? This is the most effective way to get it done. Let's get it done. Let's measure it. Let's make sure we're getting the best value from whatever route that is. Perm hire, contractor, statement of work, freelancer, whatever. But within organisations, a lot of the time, they're not really set up in that much of a holistic manner, are they? Um, I don't know if you uh, want to go first on that one, Lee, but, you know, who owns it and how, how are organisations grappling with that issue? Yeah, so in, in in simple terms, in the old days, which might only be three years ago, but in the old days, um, typically the HR or talent communities owned your permanent solutions 
and procurement owned your contingent solutions. Now, that wasn't always the case, but but it's a bit like you you, you buy a, a, an Aussie red and a New Zealand white, right? So 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 rule of thumb would be that that's how it used to be. Um, other key players were were the CIO because or CTO, whatever, not but the head of IT because you know big parts of the contingent resources were were in tech because that that was the, the nature of, of that marketplace. So did they own it or were they key influencers? Is an interesting one, but but then as the contingent resource became more consultancy, more statement of work base, which actually was a big part of that was tech become that 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 CTO has become uh, more more um, more influential, potentially potentially a decision maker. The ownership, I don't think I don't think I can give you a one size fits all. Um, the and it may be that as as the market matures, we might get to a relatively consistent owner but the message probably we we would give to our client base right now would be hr and procurement need to be or hr and talent and procurement or talent and procurement need to be aligned in order to to make sure the categorization and a triage service fits all i, I think i think for one team to own I think it's a bit much. And there are actually, I mean, there are some sometimes the procurement team reporting to the, the chief of people, and sometimes HR teams reporting to the CPO. So it's a lot easier then. So so there is there isn't really one rule of thumb, but alignment between those two or even three divisions, I think, are really needed to, to make it work. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Joe? In terms of that sort of workforce optimization angle, um, what, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I agree with what Lee says. It, 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 I don't think you can have a single owner for this. I think depending on how mature the client organisation is in actually having a holistic, um, if you like, people or workforce strategy anyway, I think makes it probably easier for it to sit with HR and procurement to be an enabler because effectively what you have then is HR owning the, if you want to call it the people plan. So, you know, what's the right mix of, uh, contingent per project you know how, how big are our, some of our internal benches for example around some of the projects we want to we want to deliver against you know what is what are our internal mobility plans you know what are our uh, our plans for growing our capacity or capability in different you know global territories for example you know if, if you've got a a workforce plan then effectively your how you engage with those different routes to market becomes how you deliver against that plan and then procurement should really be an enabler in terms of you know putting in place the right deals for you with the right service provider that can actually um if you like enable that to happen i think that's probably um quite aspirational for a large number of organizations you know there will be pockets of um hr and, and in particular you know talent management programs that do elements of that very very well i think as, as Lee's alluded to you know historically kind of um, probably contingent workers have been kind of an afterthought in that community you know it, it's very much focused first on it will be the perm workers you know then it will be you know potentially you know high worth or high value contractors fixed term contractors etc um, you know and then you'll, you'll start to get into the kind of the, the more peripheral workforce became became an afterthought but again I, I personally think as you've seen you know the 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 nature of work change. You know even even pre pandemic in terms of you know people were talking about how you know the different demographics within the labour market want to actually engage. You know you don't have jobs for life anymore. You don't even have maybe have jobs for two or three years. You have you know independent individual consultants. The HR community was already having to think about how how their workforce plans changed in that space to be responsive to the marketplace so so now pushing forward it's kind of like you know if, if they embrace it and they can get to that as I said what is probably quite an aspirational goal you know they will have genuine um, you know business performance enhancing access to talent via via different routes yeah and it's um you make a good point and I think it it kind of ties into the data side of the conversation in the sense that it might not necessarily be a central function that owns it all, but if you can centralize the data and if you can understand what's happening, where you're getting things done, understand what's driving value for your organization, then um, that's essential for the decision-making process. And it allows the organization to move away purely from a cost-driven analysis 
and strategic uh, approach to more of a value driven one. Um, but I think the data, people are starting to get better at it now. And I think if you look at contingent worker programs, they've been pretty good around data. They're, they're fairly mature in terms of the use of technology and the way that the programs are in, implemented. Um, certainly what we see on the service of procurement side is it's a much lower level of maturity and that mm. data kind of needs to catch up, but also that data needs to be, be centralized. Um, but, you know, Lee, from, from your point of view, that, that would be the kind of uh, the holy grail, really, wouldn't it, if you're running a program, just have all the data nicely in one place? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have that all the time, Johnny. Um, but it goes go back to that traditional thing which Joe said at the beginning there, that visibility and control, isn't it? Uh, I mean, d- data is, is, is potentially historical as well, so we've got to look, look, look forward. But um, the, there are tools out there that enable us now, Johnny, isn't it? So we do have, as I'm sure many have, Power BI. So just in case we had multiple systems uh, uh, feeding into one solution, uh, we can at least have this single point of truth um, through through the aggregated um, you know the, the view the view from from the multiple so so I think I think I think it's actually pretty easier than we we uh, we imagine assuming that you have absolutely got at all of it from from your client from your client and so supplier base um, does that does that evidence is that obviously because the evidence is what's happened trick is in what what next and what the future looks like and what what we do with it and how to engage so um i'm relatively confident on the data piece given given as i say the portals are available what will make life easier i suppose for everybody uh uh, johnny is is is, this one system that did it all nicely not just for for the supplier side but also for the for the hiring manager or buying manager side to make sure it's just that 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 one click that kind of single sign on one click that's probably probably the, the not just to engage, but also for them to see the, the the data themselves. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. And, you know, you made the point about that, that for you guys having the data, you're going to be able to manage that. That's what you do. The difficult bit is getting it out of the client. Um, but I think also when you're looking at systems and, and user adoption and things like that, you know, from our point of view as a technology provider, we have to make our system really easy to use. It mm-hmm. massively helps with adoption yeah. um, you know modern kind of consumer style interfaces are just what people are used to rather than the kind of really clunky stuff that is in, in a lot of cases those legacy systems are still in use because they're really big technology organizations that have been around for a long time um but yeah driving that is absolutely critical to it in terms of giving a smooth process i think it's it's an interesting one because if you try if you wanted to kind of like one ring to rule them all it's very difficult that, that no service provider is going to be the best at everything. Mm-hmm. You've obviously got huge players like SAP that will buy different uh, solutions and combine them all together. And that's even within uh, organizations like that, it's extremely difficult. It takes a very long time to do that. Um, but one of the things that we're seeing, you know, we have to integrate a lot. And one of the things that we're seeing is this kind of single sign on mm-hmm white label type approach where you might actually just have a triage at the front end with single sign on. um, And that single sign on obviously helps with things like security as well, um, which then guides the buyer through that triage process. And then either off to, for example, a contingent workforce interaction in a VMS, um, which might be branded up for the client or the MSP and vice versa. If it's an SOW, it might drive them towards, for example, a platform like ours. Yeah. And in that scenario, what they're doing is they're just going through different screens. So yeah. if they've got single sign-on, and at the end of the process, all reporting is looped up into Tableau or SciSense or Power BI, yeah. that from the buyer's point of view, that is a holistic way to do it. So it's really interesting to see the way the market has developed in terms of knitting together these types of solutions. Um, but as you say, every client is different. So you always need yeah. a level of flexibility. Yeah, yeah. No, but you're right. If you're driving a car, there's certain engines you know the gear sticks all of those things so we, we we have this we have this gateway but the you do need we do need in the best in class vms you know marketplace platform distribution platform etc uh, deployment tool vetting tool etc and they don't all come in one but we do, we do have the gateway and we do have the the the, the portal we, we, you mentioned three of them we do use power bi to um to present the data in, in one format but keeping it simple like say adoption uh, yeah, I'd love to think that all of our all of our uh, uh, clients d- d- do that, Johnny. But we do end up um, do end up guiding them through 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 the process, single sign on or not. But um, yeah, I, I agree. I think I think we got there with a the gateway, haven't we, Joe? That that kind of single. Yeah, 
I mean, we we proactively, for example, within our in our uh, discussions with our clients, you know, we talk about our technology stack because you know it, we couldn't come and tell you that there's a single system that would do everything that you would need to do if again you're looking at all of those different types of workforce engagements. And if you look at, say, for example, how complex it is. Um, you know, managing, I don't know, within a contingent worker program, something like, you know, the uh, agency worker regs and the checkpoints that you need to have physically inbuilt within a best in class VMS system to operate in the UK market for for AWR and IR35. You know, you've got a very discrete set of um, functionality that you would want within your VMS that you wouldn't necessarily need within your, you know, your services procurement Mm -hmm. vehicle, but actually, you know, some of the tools that you'd want within your services procurement uh, vehicle you, you you know you clearly don't need if you're employing PAYE temp so you know the, the beauty is trying to knit all of those best in class things where actually there is a real niche piece of functionality that sits in those things together and again again interesting I was explaining it to uh, the same group of graduate trainees and for me it's, it's no more complex than saying you know you've got a phone you've got a single device and actually you access different apps through that device whereas actually 20 years ago I might have had a a phone on my desk I might have had a calculator on my desk I might have had a calendar on my desk but now I've actually got all of those things in one place so actually from the from a UI perspective it's a far more seamless um, engagement and you know that did obviously grads, adoption did those grads fall over in disbelief when you said that so, um, shortly after I told them when I first started in recruitment that um, we used to leave messages on the phones of candidates to ask them to call into the office um or write them letters because people didn't have email or mobile phones. So yeah. I, I aged myself significantly at that point. Sorry to diverse, Johnny. Yeah, no, 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 I love it. It's, I was uh, watching something with my uh, 11-year-old the other day and I mentioned that something ha- happened and I, I said, of course, there wasn't social media around. And she was like, what? <laughs> social media didn't exist in those days. I was like, well, actually thinking about it, pretty sure smartphones didn't and the internet had only just started. Um, <laughs> But listen, I'm really, really enjoying this conversation. But to wrap things up, last thing I wanted to kind of pick your brains on was um, a point that um, was made earlier was the resource market is scarce. Okay, so it doesn't matter what channel you're going through, particularly in certain areas where there's like absolutely in technology, for example. Um, So organizations need to be able to adapt to using different workforce channels to, to get the work done but but it in talking about evolution we talked about the evolution of the msp the way different programs the evolution of um sow as part of this workforce mix and and one of the things that i quite find find quite fascinating is if you look at like the way that organizations are trying to attract candidates and how that's now starting to cross over into the thought process to how they how they deal with um suppliers so so Joe, one of the things that um, you've mentioned to me before was about employer um, value proposition. Um, And obviously, you can look at that from how organizations are interacting with their perm in-house teams. And there was definitely an evolution to that being um, brought into the contingent side. But have you noticed much in that side in terms of it becoming more holistic? Um, Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we'd we'd almost kind of thought about the concept and I think I've, I've read elsewhere so I can't take credit for it but you know it's not just about the E in EVP standing for employee E prop, uh, value proposition actually it's about the engagement value proposition for for the supply chain as well so whether that's you know the social value that or um, that that organization is looking you know looking to or, or to um, to garner from its supply chain, you know, whether it's the approach of the supply chain to, you know, the, a wider ESG um, agenda, for example, you know, all of those things are becoming important in terms of that, um, I don't know, the, the quality of the interaction between the suppliers and the organisations that they're working with. And, you know, if you, if you bring it back to, you know, the very simplest thing around, you know, the employee value proposition, you know, first of all, it has to be, you know, you, you can't just say it, it has to be, you know, perception and reality have to be, have to be the same thing kind of thing. So that level of authenticity that, you know, exists in a, an EVP is going to have to be something that potentially, um, you know, begins to resonate between suppliers and their supply chain. If actually, you know, they, they really want to care and really want to progress forward in, some of these areas it's I, I once heard somebody um I was talking about um their their EVP and you know they talked about um you know how they were a, 
you know attractive to a particular demographic in the workplace and it was kind of you know there's all this talk about autonomy and um you know how people were able to do their jobs and actually their EVP then came down to um you know actually you know that wasn't people's experience of that if you if you read their their glass door profiles for example um you know it very much came down to some you know some real kind of you know what I'd call sort of like you know almost quite like kind of you know quirky giveaways that you know it's all like you know you might get um I don't know free fruit every day or kind of you know the the sort of stereotypes of you know you've got a pool table or a, a football table you, you know you've, you've got to make it real value things within that supply chain they're actually gonna you know resonate with both the organization and the supplier themselves not just you know jargon pretty much yeah um totally agree um i'm only joking when i say this but we just went for a a, a zip wire into a ball pit and thought that that should sort it out but <laughs> but yeah you're right it's got to be authentic it's got to the, the uh the promises have got to match the reality um and, but it's both ways isn't it it goes both ways yeah. in the sense that you know whether you're looking at permanent employees contingent workforce and suppliers now i think everybody's becoming more discerning um, and ESG is such an important factor for everybody in business. Um, I, I do think that, you know, suppliers are, are considering that now as well, not just in terms of the fact that there are limited, if they're, if they're a supplier that works as a consultancy in cybersecurity, for example, they're going to be very much in demand. But, but there's the ethical side of it as well, where they're going to want to align themselves, even with paying customers that fit into the, the same profile of themselves in terms of their ethics, um, I don't know whether that's something that you've seen kind of changing more in the market, Lee. Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, to, to, to sort of just to go back onto Joe's last point or your point about resource, yeah, what we are saying to people, however you, you engage that resource, permanent, contingent, service, you know, just make it make yourself as attractive as possible and make the process as simple as possible is the summary, Johnny. And, and that, that attractive as possible from, from an ESG perspective is is becoming more important so if i think about us as a provider um we have a particularly good um uh, esg program and, and have done for a number of years and it hasn't actually often benefited us um it, it hasn't but more recently it has and we've seen that we've seen we've seen ourselves being selected as a supplier based on our esg program so so that's been encouraging to see so we're actually seeing it come to life as us as a provider um and 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 for us to make sure our supply chain has has uh, has a has a position now and, and and we'll do in the future as well so we're managing it right the way through um how important it is for then um engaging resource um particularly in, in a traditional sense i think that will become more and more important i don't because of the labour market right now and inflationary pressures, speaking, if you want me to a truthful answer, does a candidate make an employment decision, be it contingent or permanent, based on the ESG? Nine times out of ten, they don't, because they're after more money. That that is the current pressure point for resource. I think it will circle back, but actually, as a supplier of services or to be a professional service provider, ESG is quite important. It doesn't hasn't quite filtered to the candidate market particularly, but from the supply chain, it has. Yeah, and um, you know, it goes right the way through to you know how effective organisations are in winning business um, and how what valuation they can get on IPO, for example. So it's it's at the point of it's 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 important for a company to do the right thing Absolutely. and therefore it's important for them to have a supply chain that do the right thing and it's kind of filtering through mm. um but yeah it's really really interesting to see that um but listen um i'm going to wrap things up there really appreciate both of your time and we're almost uh, about to kind of uh, run over our window but um that's been really interesting and uh, some great insights from both of you so i really appreciate you taking the time to come and have a chat um <laughs> I think we're all going to be quite busy, aren't we? It seems like there's a lot going on. <laughs> hope so, but thanks for having us, Johnny. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure. Um, brilliant. Well, listen, um, again, interesting insights. Uh, great to get your take on all this stuff. Thank you very much for taking the time. And uh, yeah, look forward to catching up with both soon.